Hello, everyone. Welcome to this new Cube Conversation. I'm joined today by Simon Tell, who is the CEO and founder of Haiku. So, uh, Simon, welcome. Great to have you. It's great to be here, Christoph. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, so I love the company name, Haiku. Obviously, people who don't know, it's a form of poetry in, J in Japanese. It's a very short form uh, type of poem that's uh, supposed to be brilliant for its simplicity. So. Uh, obviously, ease of use is a big deal, especially when it comes to the space of backup recovery, disaster recovery, ransomware recovery. Can you catch us up with where you're at from a business standpoint? Sure. You, you know, the, the name Haiku came out of this idea that we wanted to build a business in which we could conceptually simplify the taking of all the world's data uh, and making it easy to restore at the click of a button. And we thought, you know, what's a word that really means that in another language? We thought about a haiku poem where they're taking all the data in a language and boiling it down to just those three lines. Uh, and then we thought about the acronym. We said, okay, what do we actually do? We actually keep data up and running. So that's hybrid cloud uptime. And that's how we came up with the name haiku. So thank you for pointing that out, Christoph. You know, today, haiku was the world's fastest growing data protection as a service company and the world's number one leader in SaaS data protection. We've got over 4,000 customers in 78 countries. Uh, we've got well, uh, we've got hundreds of employees around the globe in ten different offices, and we've raised over 140 million dollars from Bain Capital, A Crew, Cisco Ventures, Atlassian Ventures. The list goes on and on. Um, but I think what I am most proud of in our space is that Haiku, comparatively against every other data protection vendor out there, offers 96 different application and database backup and recovery integrations in our platform, meaning that we cover. A, a much wider swath of data protection in the market versus anybody else uh, worldwide. Well, that's very impressive. And, and we'll talk about that because I think we should put this in the context of, you know, relevance. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because you've actually just published this great report and we'll bring up some data points from it. Uh, and the first one is this one, which is really blowing me away that 22 on average are 22 SaaS applications reported by IT, but in reality, uh, most mid-sized companies will have over over 200. So that's a lot of data, it's a lot of applications. And obviously those applications are running uh, in those environments for a good reason, it's to support the business. So this is again, data that comes from the state of SaaS resilience in 2024 report uh, that you guys have just published. So let's talk about this number. Um, yeah. Obviously, 22 applications on average. I'll talk about the the, the lower, the sm smaller number. Uh, 22, I, I don't know. I've been looking at vendors for a long time. I'm looking at who supports what. Uh, I think at best I see five or six uh, SaaS environments applications supported on average, maybe a little more. So uh, what about the other ones? What happens if you do well, not actually have a backup? Yeah. So first and foremost, I think if we look at this this statistic, what it's really pointing to is a massive gap in the industry's knowledge of what's actually being used in our own companies. And that in and of itself is terrifying. You know, in the old days, pre-SaaS, pre-cloud, if you had a challenge, if you lost some data, if you lost an email, if you didn't know where something was, the very first call was to IT. And unfortunately, over the last sort of 10 years with the spread of SaaS and the spread of cloud services, IT has been forced to cede a lot of that authority and control to the vendors that are being used by the lines of business. So a great example of this is, you know, pre-Office 365, you had Microsoft Exchange. It was sitting in the basement, right? It was, it was either in a hosted account or it was sitting in your own, your own servers uh, in your own storage capacity. And what that meant was when something was lost, you'd simply call IT and IT would know exactly where it was and they'd restore it. Well, you know, many, many, many people thought, and according to our analysis, about 80% of the world believed that once they moved to Office 365, they could pick up the phone and call Microsoft, and they were going to give them uh, their data back or get that email back for them. And as you and I know, Christoph, that's absolutely untrue. The shared responsibility model has set it up so that just like with cloud, they might back up their data and their infrastructure. But if you call a SaaS vendor and, and say, for the most part, hey, I've lost my own data, can you recover it for me? The answer is going to be, that's on you, that's not on us. And so so I think I think that is challenge number one, is understanding the myth that the SaaS vendors actually can and will restore your data for you. And then I think going to this, this specific number, 
where, where we where we've ended up is in a position where IT isn't even sure anymore how many SaaS services are being run in their environment. So you know those numbers are, are so incredible to me. Um, if, think about a large organization. Think about a large bank. They've got thousands of different apps running. If the IT department is only aware of a small fraction of those apps, how can they possibly respond to threats? Uh, and you know, given what happened with CrowdStrike just a few weeks ago, it's very, very clear that the SaaS entry point for ransomware attacks and for mistakes and for issues uh, is is a massive, massive and critical issue uh, for companies. Absolutely. So th this is one thing that we'll talk about in a second. It's a very interesting um, data point in the research. Uh, but I think there is a misunderstanding of what shared responsibility means. And it's clearly explained, though. I mean, you look at the model and, and various vendors have their own version of that model. It makes it very clear that it's your data, your responsibility. Uh, but yet people somehow think that are magical people in a cloud somewhere yeah, doing yeah, their best stuff. It's not the same thing with cloud, though, right? I mean, if you think about the adoption curve of, of cloud, we, we were one of the sort of, you know, pioneers in the cloud data protection space, protecting... Uh, Google Cloud first, then Azure, and then uh, AWS. And time and time again, when we would speak to customers, they would say, "I I thought that Google had my had all my data. I thought I could call them and get it back." And now that seems almost humorous. You know, nobody would expect that they're going to call on Microsoft or AWS, and without any backup support at all, uh, be able to get be, get all their data back in real time. They go out, obviously, they get a third party, you know, data protection vendor like Haiku. Well. That same problem now exists in the SaaS world, but it's far bigger. You'll remember that a year ago, I authored a book called Averting the SaaS Data Apocalypse. And that entire book, the premise of it was, there's a myth that is so prevalent in the world today, which is that the SaaS vendors are going to be able to restore your data. And what we want to do is dispel that myth so that, not just so that we can sell our own platform, but so that every company everywhere has the knowledge and the insight to be able to start tracking, managing, and better understanding where their data is and where their vulnerabilities actually are. So you bring up a couple of very good points, uh, and then I'd like to uh, double click on, on ransomware too, because that's a hot topic. Uh, the, the, the point being is that data that is not protected or tracked, and against basic data management, is essentially an exposure. So you cannot de-risk uh, your organization if you do not understand where all the data is and if and how it's protected uh, from deletion, whether voluntary or not. Uh, and, and again, that's something that literally can uh, have you end up in jail. Uh, so this compliance issue is it's just big enough of a problem, I think, that you should yeah. take care of it. You're absolutely right. I actually, I, I gave a, a, a presentation to about 100 uh, CISOs recently. And, you know, the, the emotion in the room was not excitement. It was not, uh, it, it was not, you know, a uh, thirst for knowledge. It was fear. It was fear because the legislation and the regulator regulators worldwide have started to change their approach to dealing with cyber. And they're putting a lot more of the burden personally on those who are in charge of protecting data. Uh, and that's a terrifying prospect. You know, we've already seen a few CISOs end up in prison. Um, simply for not being able to, you know, present regulators with the required documents, the required logbooks, the required data on request. And so I think there's a massive drive within the CISO community um, to figure out how they can protect themselves and certainly their organizations. But I think what's got to happen is, is now we've got to see that move beyond the CISO and all across IT. Because what IT needs to do is be able to understand where their data actually is so that they can then protect it. And obviously that's why we introduced the IQ R-Cloud and R-Graph uh, module, which essentially allows you to discover where all of your data sources are uh, and then get deep insight into whether or not you're going to be able to recover should, should it be an accidental deletion situation uh, or should there be a, a terrible ransomware attack as well. Right, well, let, let's uh, talk about ransomware because I think that's really the elephant in the room. Um, we talked a little bit about a recent outage. Well, that was not ransomware. So can you imagine if it actually had been intentional? Uh, uh, I, mean, you know, I think it points to a bigger problem, which is it's, it's not just ransomware attacks, right? It, it's it's when, when, we, when we cede control of our data 
to third parties. There's a lot of great advantages. They host it for you. They make sure the service is up and running. There's some terrific value, amazing value that comes from SaaS. Where is SaaS vendor? But there are also risks, and those risks need to be understood. And as you rightly point out, it's ransomware attacks and it's accidental deletion. Somebody goes in and just deletes something, you're really out of luck unless you've thought this through and you've got a plan. Sorry, Christoph, go, go back to you, though. Yes, yeah, exactly. Well, actually, I wanted to bring up another data point um, from, uh, from your research, and actually two of them. First of all, 61% of breaches have actually uh, come from a SaaS uh, environment as a source. Um, I think enough said here. <laughs> it speaks for itself. What's interesting also is the average cost of a ransomware attack in 5.3 million on average, of course. Your mileage will vary. I think that's actually a pretty low number. Uh, but it's a number, at least it's an estimate. And the truth is there are so many direct and indirect costs, reputational costs, and again, compliance uh, exposures and risk exposure that come with it. And it's just general trust in uh, the vendor itself. I mean, do you really want to keep working with this vendor? And with your and, and what about your employees? What about your customers? What are they going to think about you if you fail delivering your service because you've picked a vendor that uh, has somehow been breached because of your own lack of preparedness? So I think these are important topics. Uh, so tell us a little bit more about what you do specifically around ransomware. Maybe a couple of anecdotes. I know you have a ton of clients and maybe you can't give us all of the details, but I know there are some interesting war stories. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about, well, the state of the market and, and actually who actually protects what. Uh, yeah. but let's start with that, yeah. with ransomware. Sure. So, so, so starting with the numbers, you know, we reached out to over 400 different um, organizations worldwide. And, you know, we, we asked them, have you suffered from a ransomware attack? And out of all of the respondents that answered yes, it was you know, not on the survey, um, out of all the respondents that answered yes, 61% of them then it went on to say, and it, the source of the ransomware attack was a SaaS service, right? 61%. So if we extrapolate that, and we know that there's about, you know, one ransomware attack now every six seconds on planet Earth. Um, the, the, the level of complexity in terms of protecting that environment has grown just exponentially over the last few years. And so, you know, the way that Haiku has addressed this is, is twofold. The first is we said, we've got to make it easy for customers to understand all the SaaS applications they actually have. So problem one, number one is if you can't see it, you can't protect it. Um, and, you know, what we realized is that, you know, in the data protection world or landscape, Historically, you had a different platform to protect every single data silo. So there was a great, you know, uh, backup vendor back in the day that protected Unix. There was another one that protected Windows, another for VMware. That model is completely broken now. Uh, and so what the vendors tried to do is start adding additional products, which ultimately meant the same thing. You had a different screen to protect this workload, a different screen to protect that workload. That was okay when customers had one cloud and you know maybe two different types of on-prem installations but today the average customer has over 212 different vendors providing different services on which their data resides 212 so the idea that you would have 212 different services or different backup products to protect you was nonsensical to us and so what we said is how do we create sort of the ultimate swiss army knife of data protection we're going to help customers to first visualize where all that data is. We do that with what we call Haiku R-Graph. It automatically discovers your environment. It tells you where every single SaaS, on-prem, and cloud service is in your environment and whether or not it's protected, meaning whether or not you'll be able to recover should there be a ransomware attack or another incident. That's part one. Part two is we can then pull up, automatically pull up the Haiku Marketplace where we've now got over 96 different integrations that will allow you to get backup and restore for SaaS on-prem cloud. So, so, so what we're effectively doing is we're taking all of the world's data protection vendors, putting them all under one roof, but it's all Haiku. Um, and then we said, you know, you know, this is this works really well. We've gotten to 96. That's fantastic. Um, but there's 30,000 SaaS vendors out there, and we've done a lot of work on this, and we've come to realize there's about 250 vendors you've really got to think about protecting. And, you know, the way to keep building these integrations, we realized, was not to just do it all ourselves. So we actually created an open API and a low-code development platform, and we now let third parties uh, use Haiku 
with low code development add their own modules. And we've seen just a terrific uptake take from partners and SaaS vendors who have said, hey, I want to come to you. I'm going to use the Haiku platform, and then I'm going to push that out to my customer base. And one of, the, one of my favorite examples of this is iManage. Um, iManage, is, for those of you who don't know, is sort of the go-to uh, storage vendor for records of importance in, across every law firm worldwide. And law firms have been using iManage with terrific success for years to make sure that they've got all their confidential files and information. Well, iManage, you know, heard about our cloud and their CEO reached out to me and said, you know, hey, Simon, we're not a backup vendor. We don't want to be. You know, what we'd love to do is we'd love to have Haiku work with us so that we can have a module on the art cloud on the Haiku marketplace. And we worked together with them for about three months. We built a great, a great integration. Uh, and we'll be launching that in December. And, you know, I know iManage has gone out and talked about this publicly, so it's okay to say this. But that means that all 4,000 of their law, law firms now have the capacity, all 4,000 of their customers will now have the capacity to have true enterprise-grade data protection. And Christoph, to your point, nobody else is taking this approach. And it's left an incredibly broken model in the marketplace. Because if you, if you go to all the major leaders, so-called leaders in data protection, and you add up every single one of the SaaS, uh, SaaS vendors they protect, the number's less than 10, it's maybe five. You know, here's Haiku, uh, a newer market entrant, and we've got 96. So, so I think this is a very, very different approach to data protection, and it's certainly the right approach for the time today and highly future-proof for tomorrow as well. Well, Simon, we've covered a lot of ground, so I, I totally agree. And I think uh, there, there are some interesting analyses out there. And of course, some are coin leaders, et cetera. But the fact is, I don't know how you can call yourself a, a market leader or be anointed market leader if it turns out you do not protect actually most of the data that's in SaaS environments. It doesn't make any sense to me. And I can argue, you know, maybe it's the top 15 or 20 mission critical apps you should be protecting and the rest is TBD, but still, uh, you're right. I think it's, it's probably five to 10 on a good day. So uh, definitely you've demonstrated, I think, a form of leadership that is very modern uh, and that is exactly where I believe the market is going and what is needed. And well, until we get the next unfortunate problem, uh, I think uh, people probably have plenty of time not to think about those blue screens. They recently saw the airport and at their medical office and ask themselves, oh, what if next time it's actually something that is intentional and what are my, um, uh, the vendors I work with, what are they doing to protect their environment and get back from it? So Simon, thank you very much for your time. Uh, pleasure to have you here on uh, this CUBE conversation. And uh, well, I uh, can't wait to see that press release when you get to 100. <laughs> thank you very much, Christoph. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you on the next Cube Conversation.